phone? Because we're live. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to call for some matches. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, another Cigar Chat. Uh, love broadcast live on CigarFederation.com and yeah. broadcast weekly on the Armed Forces Radio Network. Thank you uh, to all of our brothers and sisters out there throughout the world who are keeping us safe and fighting for our freedom. We appreciate everything you guys do. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, again, uh, Robbie Raz, your uh, host, Cigar Federation. We've got uh, Logan down there, and it's not so green this time, Logan. You're, you, you've cleaned things up in there a little bit. It is daylight savings time, and I'm growing a beard for November, and you are not the host. You are the co-host, just to set the record straight. <laughs> no, you're the co-host. No, we both host, Rob. <laughs> Let's get this right. Whatever. This is like episode 100, and now you're correcting me. Um, Whatever. So, I, uh, yeah, I'm actually running out of daylight myself. I, I look like I've got a big bright sun shining in my face, but that's just a, uh, that's just a little spotlight. Uh, we've got uh, joining us live from uh, – you're going to have to tell us where you are, uh, Ernesto. Uh, we've got Ernesto Padilla of Padilla Cigars joining us live. Thanks for taking the time to chat with us today. Thank you guys. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm here in Miami Beach. I don't know. I'm on I'm on the roof of uh, someone's home here uh, because it's uh, one of my girlfriend's uh, girlfriend's uh, party. Uh, so I'm upstairs uh, doing this interview, and after that, I can go find some really more mediocre beer. <laughs> and not highly recommended. I was drinking a left hand milk stout at my house, but that's a big a change. Bit. Yeah, to go to the to go to the uh, Coronas, I uh I was just down in Mexico with my wife, and it's funny Corona tastes better down there. Yeah. For some reason, if you're drinking it on the beach, uh, there's something about it. I mean, you're you're close to the beach, but you know a little bit different. I'm I'm not a big yeah. Corona guy. I, I like a darker beer myself. But uh, anyway, mm -hmm. thank you for taking the time, stepping away from the party. We do appreciate it. Um, yeah. You know, to to join us here on the show. So we uh, like I said, we're live on uh, CigarFederation.com. We've got you know a bunch of audience questions. Uh, the audience is already lined up. We've got uh, some giveaways and stuff that we'll get into in a little bit. Um, but uh, let's get uh, let's just go ahead and get started. Give everybody a little bit of background on yourself. Um, you know, if somebody's listening on the radio or they're you know they downloaded our podcast something like that, they might not be familiar with Padilla Cigars. So give them a little bit of background on uh, on yourself and the company. All right. Well, uh, company started ten years ago. Uh, my brother and I, Carlos, who's not so much, he's behind the scenes. Uh, he invested in the company and our... Let me back up. We invested in the company uh, 10 years ago, and, and um, we had a history in our family of, uh, of tobacco and cigars. We were born in Cuba, both my brother and I. I left Cuba when I was six years old. He was a little older. And... Uh, at that time, my family had been growing tobacco for a couple of generations in Pinar del Rio, Cuba, in a town called Puerta de Golpe, which is still there, very much uh, in a farm called El Colmenar. And uh, my father's um, uh, grandparents came from Spain, from the Canary Islands of Spain, which is a big tobacco-growing uh, island right off the coast of uh, northern coast of Africa there, along, along to Spain, volcano... Uh, Island, a volcanic island, and uh, anyway, uh, turn of the last century, right before the turn of the last century, um, a lot of Spanish immigrants uh, came to the New World to Cuba and uh, to seek their fortune, and they started. Uh, here we go. My buddy Victor Vitali just brought me. Look at this Corona, and <laughs> Vic. Anyway, uh, long story short, um, my my father smoked a lot of cigars. No, yeah, come back up. Say hello, Vitaly. No, no, no. Tell you oh. your story. Oh, no. Wait, hold on. Look at this guy. Look at how this guy dresses over here. Now you see him? Woo, look at that. Look, look, it's pretty fly, man. This is, huh? uh, this is Miami style, right? So yeah. you saw the cool big lighter that we're using, and now we got Chardonnay and plastic Fair glasses. Enough. But we look <laughs> at the whole place up, up here to ourselves. It's a nice deck. But we look at Miami Beach. kind of dark, but what are you going to do? Anyway, um, <laughs> the ADD interview. Yeah. Uh, like most people, I think a lot of people in the business, I, I, I had a passion for cigars. Um, I uh, wanted to get into it. We had a lot of contacts already in, in the business, people we knew, growers and things like that, my family. Uh, my father was a big cigar smoker. 
Um, in his uh, autobiography, um, he talks about growing tobacco in Cuba and uh, in his family's estate. He was uh, Cuba's foremost uh, poet. His name was Alberto Padilla. He, he knew Castro from college. He went on to become uh, one of the leading intellectuals in Latin America. In 1969-70, he published a book, Fuera del Juego, and uh, the uh, Castro government did not like. He was briefly in prison. Wow. And um, I'll tell you an analogy in the book, though, that's interesting, was um, when he is released after uh, a lot of international pressure from artists and, and, and uh, politicians around the world, um, uh, my mother and him were... Uh, were sent to a, uh, a nice estate outside Havana, if you will, where they had everything that the average person in Cuba didn't because they figured we can't get you with fire, we'll get you with uh, honey. And so maybe he'll see an error of his waves, whatever, and see that, uh, hey, dictatorship and communism ain't that bad. You know? Um, so while he's there, he gets an assigned driver and state police guy that kind of watches over him, and they drive into town. Excuse the noise. And uh, my father grew up his whole life smoking cigars. Pictures of him in Time magazine when he gets arrested in 1970. Later on, I think it's uh, I don't know if you can hear me. With the <laughs> we can. We can. Keep going. Um, he's he goes for a drive uh, with their his assigned driver at the time while they're trying to talk to him about you know some changes. They're like, hey, go out to this nice mansion out in the country and you know. Well, let's talk about the revolution and stuff. And he's going out there, and he's, his driver lights up a cigar, and uh, he goes, my God, that cigar smells terrible. You know, it's a horrific cigar. And he goes, you know, the driver turns around and says, yeah, I, I don't get what you get. I don't get the privilege to smoke the nice cigars like you get. The average person in Cuba doesn't get to smoke the quality of cigars that you get to smoke, you know, Mr. Padilla or whatever. At that point, you know, in the book, he says it's kind of like an epiphany. And he decided to turn the car around, going back to Vanna, going back, you know. Um, and uh, I think for him it was that, that, that you know, cigars were kind of maybe a connected his youth um, and what was going on in the country where he grew up uh, and the situation where it found itself, where this, this you know, such a big part of the, the Cuban culture had been cigar smoking, where you, where you don't see that so much in Nicaragua and Dominican Republic, the average person there does not have the culture of smoking cigars like the average Cuban. So to him, it was really somewhat an epiphany of a revelation there. But I grew up uh, in the Northeast, uh, in Princeton, New Jersey, and, you know, my dad would drop me off, cloud of smoke when I opened up the car, walked <laughs> to the pool. You know, the teachers were like, you know, 12 years old, what the hell? You know, they, they figured I'm Cuban, and my father smoked a lot of cigars, and that's it. So I always had a passion for cigars. I always saw him frustrated. You know, in the 80s and stuff, uh, with the quality of Cuban cigars, some friends of his would bring um, things like that. But I, uh, I went on to, uh, I grew up in a very artistic family. My mom's a writer also, um, very creative atmosphere. And so I, I studied uh, I studied graphic arts and worked for small art agencies and uh, looked around and, and saw at the time... Uh, it was a cigar boom, and I was smoking cigars. Cigars were like mediocre back then. If, if you know, if that, some were horrific, and uh, yeah, I mean, some terrible. You know, some of the packaging and names, you know, even though today doesn't hasn't seemed to have gotten a little better sometimes. But um, the boom ended in in like uh, ninety eight, you know, ninety seven, ninety eight. It ended and kind of came back. But I wanted to get out of the uh, the ad world. It really wasn't where I wanted to be, and uh, I, I met uh, my father passed away in 2000 and I met uh, Nick Perdomo uh, on a school outing because my niece was going to the same private school uh, that his uh, son at the time was and I said oh you're Nick Perdomo you make the cigars and that, he invited me over the next day I was living in Dallas at the time this was in Miami that's Runel and uh, he uh you know, he said, uh, wow, you really know a lot about cigars, you know, love to talk to you more, you know, you also have a background in, in uh, that world who kind of might be looking for someone, I'm like, oh, I live in Dallas, I'm not really too interested, I didn't think too much about it, 
you know, and I got to the point in the ad world where I was just kind of bored with it. Um, it was, uh, I don't know, 28, 27. And uh, I decided, uh, let me send him an email. Maybe I can do some freelance work, do some stuff that I kind of like. He said, uh, hey, would you fly down to Miami? I said, yeah, what's up? He goes, oh, we got a position. We're looking for someone. And I said, uh, yeah, possibly. And everyone in the ad world was like, were they flying you down? If they're not, you know, I said, no. <laughs> uh, it doesn't work like that. So um, I, uh, I went to work for him for about a year. The intention was to see if I wanted to get into the cigar business, see if I really wanted to pursue it, see what it was, what it was about. And uh, I did that, and then uh, I went with my brother. He had, you know, uh, my family had business experience, and I said, "Hey, I think we have something here. I think there's there's a history to this brand that's interesting, um, and uh, I think there's some uh, some things we can do cigar wise that are being done." And uh, at that time, we we started playing around, finding blends, and uh, there was a guy on Eighth Street called Ping Garcia. Nobody was looking at. He was making a, something called a tatuaje or tatuji or tata, or whatever <laughs> it was pronounced at the time. And so we made some art for him for a while. It was really the style that I wanted to make. All the rollers were Cuban, you know, and come in there. It was a, the atmosphere was pretty much what I liked. It was uh, at the time I don't know if anybody coined the name boutique, but it was right next to where Ernesto Carrillo, a great guy from Carrillo Cigars, started his. Uh, his cigar brand literally right next door. From then on, the thing has moved on, and now you know, got into a bigger warehouse. And but that one location uh, is no longer there. But it really set the tone. All the caps were triple, you know, triple caps on the cigars. It was the Entubado method. And then there was another element that most people didn't know about. People were like, "Well, where's he going to get the cigar? Where's he going to get that?" Well. Ping had come to the attention of a, of a business guy called Eduardo Fernandez, who owns a company today called uh, uh, both Aganorsa Agonorsa, yeah. and uh, Casa Fernandez. And uh, Eduardo is a Wharton School of Business grad. And uh, so that means he kind of knows some business, or you know, he's from the same school as Donald Trump. <laughs> they don't have the same hair, but they, I think they do like khakis. Um, so... Uh, Eduardo is an interesting guy. Him and his brother in uh, the mid uh, '80s had started a pizza delivery concept in Spain, and yeah. had made a lot of money. It was called Telepizza. It made a lot of money. Eduardo loves the land. He loves the culture of cigars. He's also in. Um, he's big in agriculture, and so he had found some talents in this in this roller for ping. And, uh, and and set them up, and so everything was there. You had this guy that knew how to make cigars in the Cuban style. You had a guy that was growing tobacco with the agronomist from Cuba in Nicaragua, and everybody was looking at it like, what the hell are these people doing? Eh, whatever. Um, this was 2003, you know. Uh, and from there, we came out, and it was like, what did I call this? And came out with the Padilla Miami 8 and 11, made on A Street and 11th Avenue, where the cigars are still made today at the El Titan de Bronco factory. You can go see them. They're there. Um, and uh, we started off the gate and started getting uh, some notoriety. I mean, myself, uh, Johnson was the other guy making cigars there at the time. And uh, it kind of hit the philosophy of what we were trying to do. A lot of people say, wow, this is one of the best cigars I ever smoked. Uh, so Miami and 11, and then we came out with the Padilla 1932, 32 named after my father's birthday. And then from there, we, we made cigars with Oliva while we were making stuff things, turn stuff more affordable. You know, that operation grew. Other companies took notice. They wanted to get in there. That moved to Nicaragua and then did its things. But the cigars coming out of there at that time were very unique and, in my opinion, very different from cigars uh, that that current factory makes in Nicaragua. So if you didn't get a chance to smoke those back then, too bad. But <laughs> they were good. They were good. So, um, Anyway, I don't, know, I don't know. I went all over the place. I don't know. What, you, you tell me what else. <laughs> that's <laughs> Logan well, settled down. Well, that's uh, <laughs> well, <yeah>. that's <clears throat> that's my reminder that uh, we have to let everybody know that we are uh, you're listening to uh, Cigar Chat on uh, CigarFederation.com and uh, the Armed Forces Radio Network. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we're here with uh, Ernesto Padilla. Um, 
Wow, man, that was. Uh, I asked for a little bit of your background, and you gave me like the background of everything. Yeah, of cigars that that like the cigar business today. Like you just gave me the whole background. That was. I, I kind of forgot that we're doing the show, and there's people watching, and <laughs> I was just listening, man. That was. That's uh, that's good history, man. Um, wow. That's I mean that some of that a lot of that stuff that I mean a lot of that stuff is is are things that I know but a lot of it you know is, is it's just a different uh, a different take on it so thank you for uh, for for giving us that uh, that nice little um, <clears throat> little history there Les, uh, Logan go ahead Skip Martin is in the chat which Skip thanks for joining Skip. Ernesto he he wants you to attest to how comfortable the Roma Craft shirts are and he wants to know why you're not wearing his shirt <laughs> yeah right. Um, yeah, this guy Skip Martin. I've known him since uh, he had a store back in in uh, Texas and stuff. Yep. And then he came out with this brand, and I with a nice skull on it. And I was like, "Hey, man, I like that. Why don't you send me one?" He's like, "Yeah, man, I'll send you one." You know, he's got like a. <laughs> Sorry, you sounded just like him. That was that you was sounded a just very like good, him. That was yeah, a very good guys, skip. Like, you know, it's like. It's not Florida Kanye, but it's close enough. You know, it's like every Instagram <laughs> post from this guy is uh, Florida Kanye. I mean, I don't know. He's like bathing in him. He's all up in him. He's him. That is genius. <sighs> Amazing. Yeah, oh, it's, man. It's like some Egyptian Taliban cotton. I don't know what the hell it is. <laughs> Yeah. That's about right. 100% Egyptian cotton. We can move on now. <laughs> yeah, that's that's amazing. amazing. That was too funny. That's You sounded just like Skip. That is awesome. Um, so so we kind of we covered kind of the early part of uh, of Padilla when you you know your cigars are being made in, in those factories. Uh, and what's So you guys have kind of gone through a rebranding over the last few years. Um, I mean, you've gone with, you know, changed the bands around, changed the look. Uh, give us a little bit of background on that. What was the impetus of the change, and, and uh, how has that been working out? I mean, you guys have been obviously much more active. Yeah, there you go. This is the uh, Padilla Vintage Reserve box rest with a uh, broadleaf wrapper, Nicaraguan fillers. Um, yeah, I guess a lot of people have seen the lion. Uh, you know, this is our Connecticut. Uh, yeah. Box of Connecticut. Uh, yeah, the the band. I mean, we've actually this leads into one of the questions that we've got from the audience. But the the band is very. Uh, it's it's just like it's like uber masculine. If uh, if you could really even say that with the big, with the, uh, with the the big lion head on there and the, it's, it's all about the using unicorns. At least you had that covered. Say that again. So, we thought about using a unicorn, but Illusione had that, so you know, into that. But, yeah, here it is, man. You know, he's not growling, he's not fighting, he doesn't have his mouth out. I don't even see it too well. Yeah, That's, crouching tiger, hidden dragon. Yeah. It's just uh, a very uh, self-assured lion. Um, here's a uh, Padilla Lynch's Reserve box. You know, it's a mix with some traditional uh, Cuban-style elements. Mm -hmm. uh, you're on the outside of the box. Uh, you can see it here. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of people ask me about, you know, the, the branding or the band on on this cigar, which which I did, and you know, I worked with some designers and stuff. No, at the end of the day, if cigar sucks, it doesn't matter what the label looks like. You know? It's true. But well. I really think that the effort put in these days to create bands is the shittiest in the history of cigar making. Did I say shitty? For all, I'm sorry. That's all right. We'll, we'll go in and edit that out. To all my friends, to all my Navy SEAL friends, you know, just we're <laughs> Okay. Forces Radio. They know me. Um, no, but seriously, uh, it's just a, a really sad time for the graphic design elements in cigars. I think there's some great, uh, some great design that's come out, but for the most part, <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, bad. really sad. And um, you know, I, I just, I, I'm sad. You're sad. <laughs> I am sad. I, I know. Listen, you know, you have a male, uh, primarily a male industry like cigar business, 
and then you have them like uh, single malts or scotch, and uh, they've managed to keep the integrity of of, um, of the packaging and and the look, and uh, and even certain brands out there have done some modern things, which I can't freaking pronounce the name, but I enjoy their, their scotch, but. But I've kept that uh, some traditional elements and kept the seriousness of the product. I love micro brews, and I think there's some out there that have done a, you know, a very enjoyable. But you know, the flying monkey or your ass in, on fire or whatever the hell the names they come up with. That's great. It can be fun for a while. But after a while, it's like okay, we get it. It's it's a you know, monkey in a squirrel hat. I don't know, whatever the beer <laughs> name is. And some of that transferred over to cigars. And in my opinion, I just think it distracts from the product and the seriousness and the effort that it takes to make this thing because it it is uh, it is definitely a more laborious product than making beer. You know, uh, my uh, and I love beer. There's a new brewery here, Winwood Brewing in Miami, which I enjoyed and invited me over, and it's great and it's an intense process, and I'm not taking away from them. But I mean, we got a we have an agricultural product that takes a tremendous amount of time for years before it's rolled and ready to go. The cigar I'm smoking right now, the Vintage Reserve, is called the Vintage Reserve, not because it's a sexy name, because it is, but because it literally, you know, tobaccos here are at least 36 months old. The wrapper, aging on it, I mean, we're able to 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 jump in into Oliva's stockpile of aged tobaccos, and they're such a bigger company. Like they can't really produce certain cigars with some of the better bales that you know Gilberto has set aside over there. So it really is perfect thing for uh, more of a a boutique company like Padilla to to utilize. So um, I don't know what the hell the question was. I got lost in, in it. You know, I, I being uber uber masculine. I mean. I don't know. I wanted something that was iconic, you know, and and we now using it on ashtrays and T-shirts, and people love it, and some people want to get tattoos on it. But I think it signifies uh, not just my brand, you know, but really what cigars are about, you know. Um, like I said, this line isn't, you know, doesn't have his mouth out to do, but <laughs> about the EU. It's just a symbol of power, a symbol of uh, of uh, elegance. At the same time, it's it's a beautiful animal. It's it's a it's an animal that's been used in heraldry throughout the ages, as you know, sure. and uh, it's been used many times in cigars also. I mean, uh, and this one, uh, I particularly loved the photograph that I saw when I replicated it. So. Did you design all the artwork? I do. I do. I sketch it all out. I work with uh, a friend of mine, Chris, and I've worked with other designers um, here, and uh, sometimes I'll design a band, and then I just completely tear it apart and Go from there. A lot of times I do cutouts. I, I cut out elements from different bands to see how the embossing will look because it's very hard to get to know what you're working with. It's designing bands is a very intricate thing in the sense that it's it's almost like a sculpture. It's a two D sculpture. You have embossing. It also the product, the band going around. You know how does it how does it translate? How does it read? How's it going to look? How's it going to photograph? What do you want to convey in the band? In this particular band, printed by TSO uh, in Holland. Uh, these are the people that do Davidoff, and then the other bands are printed by uh, Vrydag, so the people who do the Opus X band, for example, two of the top packaging printers in the world, very serious about what they do. This particular one, each one uh, has a serial number, because we want to give that feeling of, of a special cigar. I mean, even on the box itself with the Vintage Reserve, it, uh, it's numbered. You know, oh, they're all individual numbered, yeah. And... Uh, so it tells a little bit of the story in here in the Vista. Yeah, this is also printed by them. And uh, each one comes with a brochure, too. Um, <laughs> anyway, what I'm getting at is these people, Rydag and Holland and TSO, take their job very serious, and they really have a, a passion for doing cigar labels. Because it's really, at one time, you can use gold foils, gold inks, embossing, and really, it's, it's a... It's a Printer's dream and nightmare. It's a very complex process, and they've tried actually doing for uh, you know I don't know like almost 100 years or so. They have a great book on it, but they uh, they do labels for Dom Perignon and some other uh, other high end uh, brands. So there you go. It's a little bit. <laughs> we you know we've we've done this show. We've been doing this show for what two years now, Logan? 
Two years? Too long. Yeah, about. Too long. We've been doing this for about two years. I've never heard anybody talk about bands, bands. The, way that, the way that you're talking about them. And I think it sounds like the companies that you're working with, it's a good fit for you because you have, you kind of mirror their passion. Um, that's, uh, it, well, it, it, you know, but it's, I think that it's, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, I think it's, it's the cigar band's important. I mean, we're, we're going to move on from the bands here in a second, but yeah. I mean, the band's important because, I mean, it's really it's what's going to draw your customer to your product, of course. Well, I think it's really shelf and, I think it's also the history of this industry. People who are not cigar smokers, people, some people collect uh, old labels, old vistas, and and uh, it gives a great light to an industry that's being attacked today by governments for uh, being unhealthy, whatever you want to call it. Um, and and it just shows. I mean, stone lithography. That's a whole other subject. The printing was it was amazing what these people had to do to do these labels, and the care and effort it was just. Uh, you know, an extension of the care and effort that was put into the actual end product because, you know, I do both and that's what I love. It's it's hard. I couldn't go back to doing just the ad world stuff. I couldn't go back there and design a pretty uh, soapbox label or something like that. Like, you know, it, it's, it's terrible, you know, I mean, but a product that I'm involved with that, you know, takes a, a group of people to develop and, and, and blend and create and then to be able to put the kind of label I want to put behind it, um, you know, that's something I enjoy. I love. All right. Well, let's. Uh, I'm going to toss this over to Logan here in a second, just to <laughs> remind everybody you're listening to Cigar Chat uh, broadcast on CigarFederation.com um, and on the Armed Forces Radio Network. Thanks for tuning in, uh, Logan. You got some uh, audience questions. I got a list of them here, but I'll, I'm going to toss it over to you. You've been quiet. I know. I've we've been talking about sexy bands the whole time, which been actually pretty awesome. Um, question from the Hilk on the Padilla Reserve with the Crouching Tiger, Hidden Lion. Is that a family crest, or was that taken from something else? Um, on the Padilla, what? I'm sorry. Go, go say that again. On on the Padilla Reserve, the yeah. vintage, the band, yeah. uh -huh. the lion, or the Crouching Tiger. Is that a, a crest or a family crest of some sort, or was that taken from something else? The this this line, uh, this line here that we use. Yes. Well, we we use it on. It's the same line face we use. Uh, right on everything. Well, in the Connecticut changes uh, a little bit. It's actually a uh, an artist, uh, uh, Julio Laster is here, a Cuban artist, um, who did that one. He he did a pencil drawing of this one. I want to signify, you know, a creamier, smoother cigar. And uh, the other line was a little bit too intense. I don't know if you can see the illustration there. Yeah, it is a little bit different. Um, a little different. So, Softer side. Yeah. Uh, no, man. I mean, it's not a. It's not a family. Uh, it's not a family crest. Um, it's. It combines a couple of things uh, about the cigars that I like. You know, uh, there's a certain power, obviously, to a lion. There's a, a certain regalness to to a lion. It's always been a symbol of kings. Um, and I think when people, the average person thinks about cigars, they think about, you know, not, not only power, but reflection, your time, your, it's a man, a masculine product, um, uh, shared among men, you know, or I mean, band of brothers. Those in the military know about it. I've, I have a lot of friends in the military uh, that I've gotten to know through this product, that love the product. Uh, and and are sincere about it, and and particularly love uh, the logo. And that logo is to be found in some of the top units in our military, in the U.S. military. They've, they've been gracious enough to show to send me some of the pictures, which I wish I could share with you, but some I can't. But <laughs> let's just say it's you know it's nice to see it on some some stuff that's uh, you know a pretty nice piece of equipment by some serious guys that are uh, doing some very hard work and some very you know tough areas uh, of the world for us that we probably won't know about. Uh, and, uh, you know, to them, getting together at the end of a mission or, you know, when they have a moment and smoke a cigar, that's what they have. I mean, that's, that's what they, they really share, uh, share their, uh, able to take a break and share a moment together there. And that's what cigar means. And at the same time, you know, it's, it's, uh, the lion, to me, represents what you know most men should be: is confident, not necessarily overly aggressive, like I've said a million times. But 
you know, it's it's a uh, it's a cool symbol at the end of the day, and people people respond to it. So I'm glad it worked. Did Rob take your questions? <laughs> okay, well I'll go through mine, um, and I'll just I want to just to comment on one thing that you said about uh, you know guys in the military, and uh, you know they sometimes they get together for a cigar, and that's kind of their their release, if you will. Um, I was actually chatting with a guy today. Uh, he's in uh, Afghanistan, and he's part of a cigar group, and they, they get together every Friday, and they have a big herf every Friday, and he says sometimes they have up to 250 guys out there. And I just think that to me is just kind of cool, that they that can bring that many guys together at the end of a week where, I mean, we have tough work weeks. Our tough work week and their tough work week are not the same thing, um, and they can sit down and all have, and all share a cigar together. I think that's pretty cool. Um, but uh, let's. I'm going to go down through some of these questions because we've uh, we've spent a lot of time on bands. I do like the band. I, I I like the cigars even more. But I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, I did a thing earlier today. I posted a couple of photos and had everybody uh, pick the cigar I was going to smoke today during the show. Uh, I'm smoking the uh, Habana or uh, the um, the Reserva Habano, and I'm about the Toro. I'm about halfway through. Really nice cigar. It started out. A lot of pepper, uh, for me, a lot of spice right up front. Mellowed out. It's got nice earthy notes. Some coffee in there. Not a lot of sweetness, but just a little bit on the tail end. It's uh, for me, it's very enjoyable uh, in the in the Toro size here. Uh, let me go down some of these questions I've got from this one from Halfway. Uh, I'm not sure if he's here tonight or not. He says, "Where do you see the cigar industry going? Uh, is the trend of the larger, stronger sticks going to continue, or do you see more of a return to a more of a traditional cigar?" I think the traditional cigar has never gone away. I think sometimes it gets overshadowed by the squeaky wheel, you know, gets the grease, but that wheel is not as significant as people make it out to be. That's a great answer. That's yeah. We've asked this question a lot. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I want you to continue. But that's a great answer. I've never heard anyone say it like that, but I think that's a great answer. Keep going. You know, it's a business. It's a business. And so that means that you know, fair enough. If if all of a sudden, you know, putting uh, Krispy Kreme donuts around a cigar is going to sell more of them, you're going to see people put Krispy Kreme donuts around a cigar and try to put them in a box to sell them. Um, if you see, you know, hey, cat turd is the hottest thing on a cigar, you're going to see an idiot put cat turd on a fuck. Excuse me, on a cigar. You know, if you see, hey, you know what, donkey male Droppings. members are the size of cigars we should be smoking because somebody, I don't know, has some kind of wet dream about that. <laughs> Did you say wet dream on the show? Yeah, uh, you can say that. You know, so that's it's cool. Okay. I mean, Nick Owen, you're on a roll, man. <laughs> it's like, you know, if you want to smoke a donkey strong, you know, whatever, or an elephant, you know, I mean, then, hey, you know. God bless you in America, but uh, I and there's a reason why people for 500 years it's not like they didn't say hey you know Pedro why don't you smoke a 70 ring gauge you know I mean it's just because it would be stupid because <laughs> you're a moron. Oh man, I love it. <laughs> oh, I love it. Legend of Zelda uh, playing idiot. I don't know. I mean, you know, what can I tell you? Where Where is the cigar business going? No, seriously. Um, I think it will always be here. I think, uh, of course, we're all waiting for the guy who's uh, about 200 miles south of me to die, you know, or as most Cubans in Miami hope, slowly asphyxiate to death and throw himself in a cauldron tar or whatever, you know, Mr. Castro over there um, and his brother Raul the douche and... Uh, <laughs> And then, then they got their crony Maduro in Venezuela. It's just a loser pot of people down there. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen there, but that will probably be obviously the biggest change, you know, the ability to blend with Cuban tobacco. But we have families uh, uh, that still have land in Pinar del Rio and uh, grow tobacco, and they have to grow for volume and how, they, how the structure is, you know. Uh, free market, man. Uh, what's that? Uh, Adam Smith, you know, uh, uh, the Baker, the whatever. I forgot the freaking uh, the quote about it. But basically, you know, if you let people uh, pursue 
their interest, society as a whole will actually benefit. You know, the baker's interest is to make a better loaf of bread for a decent price. Somebody else makes it for a better pizza price. That doesn't work down there. There's no incentive. The incentive is, if you're a cigar roller like the ones we have in Miami, is to steal whatever tobacco you can, sell it to the tourists that come to the island, and try to make a couple more cents or dollars, whatever you can, to survive because communism sucks. Socialism sucks. You know, let's face it. It doesn't work, you know. Um, and uh, without getting to the big political spectrum of it, 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 you know, and capitalism is scary and it sucks, you know, sometimes. You know, it's a lot of hard work to build a company. It's a lot of hard work to, to make it happen. And, uh, you know, all America does is provide an opportunity for you to go out there and get that done. Um, and, and that's more than anyone can ask for. And, I mean, uh, the cigar business uh, will always be here. I think its future will always be uh, right, but with some thunder you know, clouds hanging around. You know, we got some serious legislation and things. You know, my industry is manufacturers. We made it to Biltmore. It looks like the Godfather meeting. Beautiful hotel here in Coral Gables. It's like all these manufacturers are there. Like, we got to get, or, you know, we got to get consumers to freaking really get involved with the CRA thing. Don't they understand? They're taking this away. It was like, well, listen, we got our consumers trying to fight a war against some crazy people with shit on their heads. Not as cool as my shit, but, you know, and really long crazy beards doing stupid stuff out there. We've got people trying to take their kids to school in the morning and pay their bills and live their life. And, we, you know, our job is to fight that fight. We need your help. We need the consumer's help to fight that fight. Absolutely. You know, and writing your congressman does help. But that's our responsibility. What you can do is to continue to enjoy the products and to continue to speak about things. And, uh, you know, and look, there's a blonde. Sorry. Blonde was about to distract me. Um, that's 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 our thing, you know. You can't. Uh, it's a it's a it's a tough battle. We've had some crazy things where the S chip was looming. It, it, this might sound crazy, but how it was written at that time was ten dollars a cigar tax. Can you imagine that? Wow. You have to be careful. Australia has a ban on packaging. You talk about packaging, you know, and is it significant on that? Well, to the Australian government, it is to the point where. Plain bands, just the writing, what the brand is, no packaging. Humidors have to be, can't be exposed. Like in Canada, I mean, I don't know what the hell happened to them. Those freaking crazy Canadians up there. I'm just kidding. I like you guys. That's a funny <laughs> Seriously, what the hell happened? You know, they might look down at the crazy Americans down here, but at least we can enjoy cigars. This is the best country in the world, period, and the best country in the world to enjoy a cigar. I mean. You go to Europe, people are paying serious money to enjoy a cigar. And uh, I, I, uh, my mom, believe it or not, I'll bring this and bring up my mom. You know, she's Cuban. She grew up with my father smoking cigars. He's like, ah, I smoke too many cigars. You know, I don't go crazy on the cigars. <laughs> like, yeah, that's what I do. Hey, you smoking a lot of cigars? I'm like, this is what I do. I smoke cigars. Your husband smokes cigars. You're Cuban. Hello. You know? And, uh, and so I was in New York City, and I saw uh, an oncologist uh, uh, there, not because, thank God, I see him. And I'm not trying to say, well, this is a healthy product. Don't get me wrong. But I was kind of curious because he was a specialist, I found out, in oncology in New York, a top guy. And I said, hey, man, i got to ask you, what a cigars? That's kind of you know, oncology or you know, study of cancer or whatever. Dreaming. And he said, listen. It help, I, nothing in excess. Yes, there's a lot of health issues associated with tobacco and things like that. But at the end of the day, what better way for me and some of my friends to relax them with a cigar? You know, and uh, the benefits, you know, are there. You know, stress is, is a tremendous factor for causing a lot of issues and things like that. So, I mean, a uh, cigar to me and to most guys that I know is just an opportunity for to get together and enjoy the product. I will tell you there's a big difference from when I saw my father smoking cigars to what I see today where, you know, a cigar, a whiskey, a wine, a great beer shouldn't be the reason for the show. It should be an accompaniment for, you know, the evening. And so we all, we, 
there's nothing wrong with having a passion. You guys have a passion for this and things like that. But you know, it's, as long as you remember that it's it's about enjoying it with your friends and your family and being able to exchange different brands and try different brands. It's a really exciting time for cigars, for micro beers. You know, imagine just having Bud Light and Miller Light for the rest of your life or whatever Budweiser. I mean, thank God, you know, people started doing these things. Um, but again, you know. We live in an era where it's draconian. These these laws are that are just come up out of nowhere, and we're such a small industry. We're not big tobacco. And sometimes the big tobacco is not on our side, but I don't think they are. You know, um, we're primarily a small family uh, business. I mean, a lot of family businesses here. You know, small small business. I have a small business. A lot of you know. You know I mean, I have to park my uh, 900 foot yacht on the other side. Time, you know, I mean, uh, the guy from Philip Morris, he's got like two thousand, you know, for, uh, like have one. But no, no, no. Uh, but it is no, it's small business. It's small business, and uh, and, uh, it, and it's good things. You know, there's great people in this business. Uh, gotten the opportunity uh, to get a lot of help from these guys in many ways, and so you know, Jonathan Drew, Grio, Levas. Uh, my friend Victor Vitali, who's letting me use his his thing, he's visiting me here from here's his new Tortuga 215. Check it out. I think you're gonna enjoy this. This was made uh, in the same factory. Made my original Series 68. Actually, I turned them on to him and great cigar. Um, so I don't know. I rambled on there for a while. Uh, I, yeah, we're, yeah. we're gonna have uh, we're gonna make sure that we get Victor on the show here sometime soon. He's gonna have a lot to live up to after yeah, following you. Yeah, I know. After following you, man, you are uh, I, You're a I handful, to, man. I just have to ask you one question, and you just go. I love it. Like, I have nothing. I'm just sitting here. Just I'm just watching the show, just like everybody else. Pretty much, yeah. It, it, Logan, go ahead, and I know you got a couple of questions, and we've got some giveaways to do and things like that. I know we've, we've got, what, like 15 minutes left? Um, 12. 12. Okay, so we're getting pretty close to it. So There's so many and, people. There do. There's like 35 people in the chat. I can't even keep up with it. Just rapid fire through some of your questions. Why did you discontinue the three Padilla lines in 2011? Was it to make room for more lines, or was there another reason? Um, in, in 2000, uh, what, what, when, why did I do I'm sorry. Go ahead. Tell me again. Oh, now i got to find it. Sorry. Um, you got that thing. Something about discontinuing lines. Yeah, yeah discontinuing lines in 2011, yep. You know, I, we wanted to step back in order to go forward. And sometimes you need to take a couple steps back to go forward. And I think that was the case. It was a time of like, okay, let's, let's restructure this portfolio. Some other brands have done that. You know, I, I think, uh, one, um, and I love to create bands, but I needed to bring the, the, the branding together. So focus on the definitive element, which you guys talk about, I've talked about quite a bit, which is the, uh, oops, sorry, one, which is the, uh, the line motif, the Padilla script, those key elements. But then we also wanted to focus in on the structure of the brand, meaning, uh, let me use the analogy of BMW, three series, uh, five series, six series, seven series. You know, uh, your beginner uh, BMW is your 3 Series, let's say, which is kind of your Padilla Connecticut here. Um, and you go on to uh, maybe uh, the, the 5 Series, if you will, and, you know, that's the uh, Vintage Reserve that you guys had out there. Uh, vintage Reserve and uh, Vintage Reserve Maduro with the San Andreas wrapper. And then from then, we wanted to get into, you know, some really nice... Uh, blends, some even more complex blends. They're all great blends. They're all great, great tobacco. By uh, keeping the boutiqueness of the Miami 11 that people have known, and that's made at El Titan, the Brunswick factory. We make the Miami 11 Maduro and the regular Miami with a Habano Ecuador wrapper. Only six Cuban rollers down there and making some stuff for La Polina, uh, as you might know. And um, Sandra does a great job. She's the one that, that runs the factory with her husband, uh, Jose. And uh, some great rollers down there, and so that one we don't even advertise it at all. It's a very expensive cigar, relatively it's about fifteen, twelve to fifteen dollars, three sizes, all fifty ring, ga fifty-four ring gauge. And what we wanted to do is we really wanted to refocus Padilla. You know, there's there was this made it over there, and this made over here. We make our cigars. Some of them are made in the Oliva factory, the Vintage Reserve, the Padilla Reservas, 
via Connecticut. And then when I gave the distribution, uh, national distribution, international distribution in Europe to Oliva, uh, Jose Oliva was in accordance with me that, you know, a big part of the Padilla brand was Miami, was the Cuban element of that. You know, how the cigar is made, how it's processed, how it's fermented, all that. Um, and we want to get back to that. It's literally still made on H3 and 11th Avenue. And that's why it's called that. And so it was unheard of for Oliva to manufacture a brand that they don't own, unheard of for them to to now procure these cigars from another factory. And so Padilla is is a very, you know, some people, you know, loathe the word boutique. I don't know. I can't find another term for it. But it's, these are small production cigars, you know, especially the ones in Miami. And, for example, the Vintage Reserve, we can only do a maximum of 1,200 boxes a month. That's nothing for some of these big companies, you know. So we're moving on. We're going to be developing more brands. We have a super, uh, probably the, the most expensive Padilla cigar coming out, about $30 a cigar we're working on. And uh, this is uh, tobacco. It's about six years old, something that's very special coming out, made in the Oliva factory. Um, still tinkering with that, seeing when we introduced it. We've only got enough to make 6,000 cigars of it. Wow. That's it. We might do, you know, do something else in the future with some other things, but the idea is to continue to reintroduce consumers to Padilla. In 2008, when the economy sucked or whatever, you know, we did a lot of online business, you know, with some, and we did some things with some factories which I ideally wouldn't have wanted to do. And, um, and, and, uh, Beginning of 2012, we had to make a decision, and there was a big, nice check wave <laughs> in my place. It looked like that. And uh, and then, you know, it's not easy to go tell your, your partner, who's your brother. Because one thing is, like, if you find we're a business partner, you're probably, ah, that guy's an asshole. Ah, you're never going to see him again. Where's your brother? You're going to fucking see the guy. Thanks, dude. Whatever. So you don't want to, you know, there's a passion, but there's also a business side of things. And I said, you know what? We're going to have to turn that down. And he was in agreement. We really, it was time to refocus the brand. I don't know how familiar viewers are and how cigars are distributed in the United States, but for the most part, um, it, very few companies um, in uh, in the early 2000s, 2000, 2001, had their own in-house sales force. Only the big guys, General and Altidus, and Roman Julieta, and uh, Partagas, and these big brands really had the capital to cover the whole United States as smaller boutiques started getting power. Like Oliva who has a 19-man sales force throughout the United States and someone dedicated just to Europe. It, it's a very expensive sales force to maintain out there. You know, these guys that you see out there, all that is, is a very expensive thing to maintain. And so there was an opportunity there. Oliva, had, I've worked with them almost since the beginning of Padilla. And it's something we had talked about many times. The timing wasn't right. Either the SJP happened or it didn't happen. And I was, you know, I didn't do anything with the catalogs at that time. But they always felt like I do. That Padilla was a premium brand for the more serious cigar guy. And that's where we wanted to position it. That's what we wanted to do. And uh, they, they agree with my philosophy. And right now we're over 850 accounts. And we're opening more every day. Uh, retailers might have been wary, oh, but isn't wasn't the catalog or wait, then but Bing Mega and this and that. There's great manufacturers out there. Oliva's one of them. El Titan de Bronce in Miami is one of them. You know, we'll continue to make cigars with different people also as long as it suits our philosophy and they have the right materials to do things. Eventually, maybe one day, uh, Cuba will open up and at that point, you know, the country I was born in will go back and make cigars there. You know, but to me right now, making cigars in any other country but Cuba is still away from, quote unquote, the Padilla brand's traditional home. So till that day happens, we'll continue to work with people who are serious about making cigars, have the resources to make the cigars that we want to make, and uh, have share the same philosophy. So it's an exciting time. I think it's a great time for cigar business, some great brands. There's a lot of noise, a lot of people with a lot of brands out there. But uh, to make a consistent product is where you're going to win. Well, that's – I'm telling you, man, you've uh, – yeah, that's we're, – we're right up against it. We've got a few minutes left. Four minutes. So, um, you actually ended on a, on a nice note there. Um, 
Well, you've given us a lot of insight, man. I, I, I appreciate you being uh, so forthright and, 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 and that you're candor. On, uh, on some of your answers to these questions, I've had a ton of questions here that were already that were all submitted, and in one way or another, you addressed most of them without me even having to ask them. So um, you made my job easy tonight. Thank you. Right. <laughs> uh, so we've got uh, Logan. Let's let's do these giveaways real quick. We've got two. Yep. Pick somebody. Uh, you want me to pick somebody? Yeah, because you got to you got to send them out. All right. Um, we're we've got two uh, these the samplers that uh, that Ernesto's yeah. showing there. It's got uh, <coughs> two Padilla Reservas, plural sizes, two Padilla Reserva Maduros, and there's one special cigar in here, a Studio Tabac Padilla Figurado. And this okay. one, a 93 rating cigar aficionado. It's one that we don't make anymore. <coughs> it's only in this sampler. The sampler is only a sampler that we give away uh, at uh, Padilla events. So we've only got a few of these samplers that we did for uh, certain events. So you can only get that cigar in that sampler. And, uh, you know, we got got two there for you guys to uh, win. Okay. Well, let's uh, – I'm just kind of scrolling through the list just to see who's here. I've got to pick a winner from uh, from mine. Well, the guy who kind of started this whole thing, who brought everything up on uh, on Twitter, uh, The Hilk, I'm going to pick him. So he's one Hilky. of our winners. He started this whole thing and got us in touch with, uh, with Ernesto kind of on accident. Uh, so we'll want to pick him. And then – I'm going to pick, uh, I, I don't know, this is a new person. I haven't seen him around before. I'm going to pick Buzz Gould just because his name's Buzz. Oh, That's pretty yeah, awesome. Yeah. Buzz Lightyear. Uh, and then I've got, uh, I'm going to pick, I, I, I told everybody that I would pick my favorite question, and it was a question that we actually asked, or we didn't have to ask, and it was already kind of uh, covered, talking about packaging and things like that. That's Ghost Shadow. So I'm going to pick Ghost Shadow as a Ghost winner. Ghost Shadow. Yeah, he, he, sounds, uh, he sounds tough. Uh, so we're going to pick him. Um, so let's see. We've got to wrap this up. We've got two minutes left. So, again, Ernesto, thank you for taking the time. Take a real quick second and let everybody know where they can find you. on. You're on Instagram, Twitter. You guys are active on social. So let everybody am, know where they can uh, find you. I am uh, Padilla Ernesto on Instagram and Ernesto Padilla on Twitter. I, uh, I can't figure out how to do Facebook anymore, but, you know. You're fine. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm on there quite a bit. So shoot me, uh, shoot me a message. I've got some messages here from Lou Paulino and Jeremy uh, uh, eighty five, and then uh, I even got uh, the man who came up with uh, Cigar Weezer. I don't know if you know him, Skip Martin. Skip Martin. He actually posted uh, uh, this over here. I don't know if you can see it. Let me see. It. Is that Skip's a such a friendly fellow? I can't really tell what it is. It's a, oh, it's a well, picture of you it's talking. A picture of of uh, Skip's computer talking on Cigar Lab chat, and it says "pure machismo" leaking out of my computer. Cigar chat hashtag. So <laughs> you, know, you gotta love Skip. Skip's a friend. Of the, oh, yep. Watch yeah, out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go wear my Crow Magnon uh, super soft uh, shirt tonight. So. You know, I will say I went on vacation just recently. Went down to Mexico for a week with my wife. On the day that we traveled down there, I knew I was gonna be in the on the plane and traveling for like 10 hours and I wore my uh, I wore my Roma Craft t-shirt and I was very comfortable all day so Skip thank oh, you for that. Yeah, that's very I wore nice. my Aquatane shirt to India. It's very comfortable. Um, so uh, again uh, thanks for checking us out Cigar Chat. You can find us on CigarFederation.com uh, I'm Robbie Raz. You can find me at Robbie Raz on Twitter. Logan is uh, at Logan at Dell on Twitter. You can, we've got at Cigar Federation so that's where you can find all of us. Um, we've got a show on Tuesday. We've got La Gloria Cubana Cigars coming out on Tuesday, uh, so it's a little bit different day for us, but we'll be busy. Um, we've got another show coming on right after this, Logan, right? What is, so we've got Stogie, Stogie Geeks. Geeks. It's coming on right after Aging us. Room. Aging with Room Cigars. Aging Room Cigars, great. So, um, Ooh, Rafael yeah. Modal? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a, a busy yeah. night here on Cigar Federation, and I hate to rush everybody off, but we got a time limit. we so, got to go. Again, Thanks for checking us out, guys. We appreciate it. We appreciate all you guys on AFRN for listening. Ernesto, thanks for taking the time. You can get back to your party. And I'm jealous that you're on the rooftop in Miami and I'm cold here in California. Oh, man. Great. I had a great time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your support. Yeah, we guys. appreciate it, guys. Thanks a lot. Have a good night. Thank you.